to this research project and to doing historical research in general, I think. Um, so yeah, my name is Doug Brown. I'm at Kingston University. I'm a lecturer in geographic information systems and human geography, and I specialize in historical geography. So basically what that means is I'm very into um, digital mapping. So geographic information systems is just a, a longer way of saying digital mapping um, and doing that on the past. So um, historical geography. Um, so that means that I use um, old data sets, including old maps, but I also um, create new data sets um, or use uh, new data sets that um, encapsulate data about the past. And you'll be familiar uh, with that if you've been uh, transcribing for us, because you've been transcribing, for instance, the index of um, pensioners that uh, who, whose lives we're interested in. And uh, that includes place names, so that includes geographic data. So that means that we can do lots of interesting things with um, with geographic uh, data. We can we can do geography on on the past, as it were. Um, so yeah, uh, as you know, this is um, uh, part of the Addressing Health project, um, which is funded by uh, Wellcome and includes King's College London, Kingston, where I am, uh, Derby, UCL. Uh, the Postal Museum and U3A indeed. Um, so as part of this uh, project, um, we started off um, some years ago now, um, doing a kind of pilot study, uh, just an initial study we used uh, sample data from Oops, I've been muted. Um, wasn't me, I swear. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, great. Fab. Um, sorry about that. So I. Um, so yeah, we, we we were using a sample of data, um, and that uh, sample was uh, about one thousand two hundred individuals. We took um, information about pensioners from the postal museums, uh, pensions records, the letters to the treasury, uh, and we uh, just picked a few years. We picked um, census years, eighteen sixty one, seventy one, eighty one, and ninety one, uh, just to see what kind of data was available and. Uh, what we could do with that data, whether it was worth doing a bigger project, essentially. And we discovered all sorts of interesting things um, from that that convinced us that it was really important to do this bigger project, which um, is going to include potentially about 25,000 uh, postal pensioners. Um, so it's a, a big jump from 1,200 uh, 1, you know, 1, to uh, 25,000. So we thought it would be worth um, just checking that, <laughs> that there was something interesting in there. Um, so what we found um, was uh, lots of differences in spatial data. So I'm starting with a, a not very exciting um, chart, I suppose, um, but uh, this kind of summarizes the, um, the differences between um, different sorts of places and the outcomes for, the, um, for the, the pensioners that we found just in that sample. So um, of those 1,215, I think it was, um, only some of them were um, sort of retired as such. Some people were made redundant, some people died. So we, we excluded a, a few people. So out of 1,170 in our, in our first sample, um, the, uh, you can see this chart is showing the percentage of those people uh, in different places who retired either with ill health or because they had reached retirement age. They'd either reached 60 or 65, depending on what the retirement age uh, was at the time. So if you um, reached the superannuation age, uh, then you had retired of old age, as they put it. And um, it, if you retired of uh, basically some disease and some kind of ill health condition, um, then that was recorded. So we, we looked at this sample and we saw that there was this incredible difference that um, in rural areas and towns, which we classified as places um, under uh, 10,000 population and between 10,000 and 100,000 population, those, those were rural and town. And then urban we classified as anything over um, 100,000 population uh, with the exception of London, which we um, made its own category. Um, because it accounted for uh, such a large proportion of the, the data in total. Um, and we could see that um, rural and town, basically areas whose population was under about 100,000, um, exhibited very similar characteristics. Um, about 50% of people in rural areas and towns um, 
reached uh, superannuation age and uh, half retired because of ill health. But if you um, look in London, uh, you can see that um, over 70% of the people who were awarded a pension in those sample years uh, was awarded a pension because of ill health. So very few people were actually making it to retirement age in London. So we thought, well, that's something really interesting. Here is the importance of place for our research. So all of our research in the wider project is going to have to ask lots of questions about geography and about the, the importance of place and, and why. And we've got a few different reasons for thinking about this and a few different, I suppose, hypotheses for, for why um, things might be different in different places. I and mean, it's easy to say, well, London's unhealthy and rural areas are healthy, but why? What's, the, what's going on there? And there are a few different things. One is the working environment and one is the living environment. So just looking at working environments, just a few little examples of little snippets of things that kind of shed light on, on, on what's happening. Um, we've got this uh, image from the Illustrated London News on the left um, from 1845 showing Saturday night at the receiving office. It's a busy evening. Uh, we've got um, uh, people basically lobbing their packets and um, uh, uh, newspapers and letters, the newspapers are going through the post, um, at these uh, uh, poor chaps who have to um, stuff them into sacks and uh, pass them over to the sorters and uh, uh, you know this is the beginning of a, of a long process but it's very manual labour we've got to imagine that you know there's an entire night shift whose job it is just to drag very heavy sacks around um, and it's very dusty and it's um, not well lit. It's an, it's an unpleasant um, atmosphere. Um, so uh, in the um, second half of the 19th century in particular, especially after the introduction of, uh, of gas lighting, it was very dusty. It was very fumy, lots of noxious gas fumes um, from, the, from the, the gas lights, lots of heavy lifting, um, split shifts in London especially, and people would um, work for four hours in the in the morning, four hours in the evening, but it, very often they were commuting. Um, they weren't living right next to um, their uh, their job, as they might be in a in a uh, in a smaller town, for instance. They might be living within easy walking distance. If you're living in London and you've got to you know, get the omnibus or, or the tube or whatever, um, you know, you don't have time to go home in the middle of your you know after your first shift. So a lot of people are um, lacking sleep. Maybe they're going to the pub in the middle of the day between their shifts. Of course, this was um, very strongly frowned on by the authorities, but very difficult to control. Um, it was very stressful um, working split shifts. It was also very stressful working in a very high pressured environment. There were millions, literally millions of items of post passing through the, the, the general post office. The telegraph machine, so telegraphists who were working uh, with the telegraph machine were very prone to uh, stress related um, conditions. Uh, we see lots of um, mental health conditions cropping up with telegraphists and also um, a kind of repetitive strain injury that you might have heard of called um, telegraphists cramp at the time. Um, it was overcrowded, so if you were working very close proximity to other people, um, you had issues with social distancing, especially during the, the various flu waves of flu epidemics. Um, so in, in the 1890s, for instance, the Russian flu. Um, uh, it was very hot, it was very stuffy. You can imagine that it was a really unpleasant place to work in. Um, and uh, um, of course, if you're working in rural areas, there are a whole different set of problems. You were working very hard, carrying, carrying very heavy loads, you were exposed to the weather. Um, there, there were lots of accidents in rural areas, especially compared to, um, well, we, we have to do some more work on, on all the differences between rural and urban in terms of the, the type and uh, number of accidents, but we think rural areas, um, they did have quite a lot of accidents as well. Um, and yeah, very heavy loads. So you had to be able to carry about uh, 28 pounds when you set off on your, um, set off on your, on your, um, on your round if you were delivering the post um, in, in rural areas. So if you can imagine wearing heavy, you know, wearing heavy great coat because it's pouring with rain, it's very cold, you're carrying um, a 12 kilo sack as you start off it's going to have an effect on your joints, it's going to have an effect on, on your limbs, people got, uh, people, lots of people retired because of bunions, because of um, joint problems, uh, and so on. And um, uh, a little snippet in the middle, something that we found in one of the, um, uh, one of the documents we were looking at in the Postal Museum, um, that some, uh, someone in our growth, the postmaster of our growth, was allowed to employ an assistant, 
at uh, 14 shillings a week um, out, of, out of his own allowance um, because he had to go sick because he, he caught a chill while working on duty at the counter. So um, clearly uh, that's not confined to um, just uh, our both, but um, you can imagine it was uh, quite chilly, um, quite chilly conditions for lots of people all over uh, the British Isles. Um, and this quote from uh, Sir Benjamin uh, Ward Richardson in 1890, who was talking about the, um, the lot of the postman. The work of a postman is one of continuous busy go round. He's on his feet during the whole of his working hours. Um, the result is that the postman wears out fast. So there's something about the nature of the work that is generating um, the sorts of health conditions that we see in lots of places. Um, but there's also something about the living environments in general. It's not confined just to the nature of work. People spend you know, about a third of their time, let's say, at work, but they also um, spend the rest of their time in their, in, in their living environments, and, and, and um, that might include their home or their um, or, the, or, or local surroundings. Two very famous images, which you might have seen before, both of which are from Punch um, from the 1850s. The one on the left, I don't know if you can read this, or how well you can see it, but this uh, this is uh, titled A Court for King Cholera, and it's referring to the um, extremely overcrowded and um, very unpleasant um, housing conditions that uh, people uh, were subjected to in uh, London especially. So um, uh, in, in the most deprived areas, uh, there were um, several families to one room in many lodging houses. Um, and you can see, I don't know how well you can see this, but down at the front, there are children playing with a dead rat. There are, um, you know, scrabbling around in, in dung heaps, um, all sorts of unpleasantness the more you look at this image. On the right is an image of Father Thames introducing his offspring to the fair city of London, a design for a fresco in the new Houses of Parliament uh, in the 1850s. And we're talking about the... Um, the era of the Great Stink, where long, uh, the Thames was so polluted that Parliament um, moved temporarily uh, because it was so disgusting. Um, and uh, the offspring of Father Thames, I don't know if you can read this, are diphtheria, scrofula, and cholera. So there was a lot of concern. It was it, it, it wasn't um, a, you know, it wasn't a great unknown. People knew very well that the um, polluted water and uh, poor housing and uh, lack of fresh air and sunlight and airborne pollution were all contributing to, um, to poor health, uh, especially in London. So we think that there's something about living conditions, you know, even if postal workers were relatively well paid um, and uh, had relatively decent living conditions, they were still going to be very near to people who um, were living in terrible conditions and often in overcrowded conditions. And we all know that if, you know, for instance, even now, if you go on the, the tube, uh, you're gonna be next to people who might, you might catch something from, uh, and that was even before, um, the, the, uh, before uh, COVID appeared. So uh, living in somewhere like London, even if you yourself are not living in a room with several other families, um, you um, are likely to um, be uh, exposed to this uh, wider, uh, sort of uh, contagious atmosphere. So issues with working environments, issues with living environments. So we can um, have a little bit of a closer look at this just using the sample data that we've got so far. Um, this uh, chart shows you uh, the, the bottom line is showing the um, age of recruitment, the, the average age of recruitment, the top line is showing uh, on these bars the average age of retirement. And in London and uh, urban areas, people started work in the uh, post office at an earlier age in their mid-20s than in towns and rural areas. In rural areas people tended to start on average um, the starting age uh, for working in the post office was in the mid-30s so they had jobs beforehand. Um, you know it was uh, something that you you wouldn't do in a rural area as a, by and large uh, as, as a young boy. Um, in London, I mean we're talking mean ages, average ages, so in London we had lots of boy messengers, so teenagers as well. Um, and so there's something about the age profiles in different places, which means that people are going to be getting different sorts of conditions. Um, things like mental health problems and uh, consumption, tuberculosis, are uh, uh, diseases that are often associated with the early mid-20s. This happens much earlier. So you see a lot less of the mental health conditions and the um, and, and consumption uh, 
in rural areas just because of those ages. Now, people tend to have about the same period, tend to have about 20-ish, 22 years on average of working for the post office in them. It's just that if you start earlier, uh, you're going to be retiring earlier. Um, but uh, you would expect, nonetheless, that you would have you know, an entire working life ahead of you. People are retiring in London and, and then everybody tends to, on average, have about 10 years uh, before death, it seems, uh, according to our sample data. So we've got still more work to do there. So there's interesting differences in places. Um, I'll just show you this very briefly. Um, it, you can see that these ages in retirement, these histograms, basically the, um, the distribution of the frequency of these ages. So if you look at the bottom one, looking at the rural areas, um, you can see that most people are retiring in their 60s, which is to be expected. Whereas um, if you look at the urban and London uh, places uh, at the top, so urban, you get a bit of a peak in the 20s and then again in the 60s. Um, but uh, in London, it's uh, a much um, smoother line. It's, you know, there isn't this peak in the 60s. There's a bit of a peak, but it's fairly, it's a lot more uniform even at younger ages. So there's something about London, something about the, the importance of geography here. And we can map these um, uh, percentages of, uh, uh, of people who retired uh, in these places with different sorts of conditions. So we can see that cities um, are very, uh, so the cities are labeled, rural areas are not labeled. Um, the cities uh, are um, very poor for mental health, relatively high proportions of people who are retiring because of um, uh, mental health issues, um, but not in every city. You know, Manchester and Liverpool, right next to each other, Manchester, a high proportion of people retiring because of mental health issues. Uh, Liverpool, relatively small area. So there's something, that, there's a big question there. What's the difference? And with our sample data, we don't have enough to find out, which is why it's important that we um, get the full data set. Um, similarly, tuberculosis, Glasgow, um, lots of people retiring because of tuberculosis. Edinburgh, not so many. Birmingham, not so many. Uh, London, not so many, but Manchester and Liverpool, um, quite a lot. So, uh, and indeed Dublin. So some cities are more prone to having high rates of tuberculosis than others. So interesting to see um, what's happening there. Um, so um, this all means that we need loads more data because with only um, a thousand odd individuals, we can't slice them up in, in uh, so to speak, we can't slice the data set up um, according to lots of different regions and according, uh, and according to lots of different characteristics in the way that we'd like. Um, so with 25,000 odd individuals, we'll be able to do that in a lot more depth. We'll be able to ask more questions about where did post office employees live and work and what features of working life varied according uh, to, to different sorts of places. There are lots of different things that we can ask about this. So these points on this map, these dots are all showing where individuals who um, have been transcribed from the index, so thank you for, um, uh, to everybody who's been involved in that, um, all of these individuals uh, we've got about 8,000 of them shown on this map. So some of the dots are on top of each other. So there are a few hundred in London, for instance, but they're all quite tightly clustered. So you can't make them out that easily. Um, so each of these uh, points represents at least one person who's retired. And we can um, look at uh, where they are, what sorts of conditions they had, and start to ask questions about um, how all of these different living and working conditions changed over time and how this was reflected in causes of retirement and the numbers of uh, days off sick they had while they were working, because all of this information is, is recorded in the Postal Museum's uh, uh, archives, which we're transcribing. Um, we can also ask questions about um, uh, women, uh, who we, which we couldn't ask uh, using the sample data set, because with only a thousand or so individuals, quite a small proportion of these were women, and they tended to be in the, uh, in the later years, the 18 80s and 1890s had lots more women in the workforce than um, in the 1860s and 70s. Um, and we can see that although places like London had a high proportion of, um, you know, I haven't pulled out London specifically here actually, but um, had a relatively high proportion of women working as part of the workforce, especially in telegraphy, but in, in doing other things too, um, that it tends to be the darker the colour, the more women were retiring. Uh, this is just retirements, this isn't total workforce, this is just retirements because this is just showing the index. Um, but we can see that um, in some places over a quarter of the people who were retiring from the post office um, were women, uh, especially in Ireland and in Scotland. So it looks like uh, more rural areas had lots more women working in them. And um, uh, you'll 
uh, you'll remember if you were um, David's talk, the last talk about uh, the, um, the elderly postmistresses of, uh, of, um, of the UK, uh, that um, there's this kind of stereotype of, uh, of women working in uh, as postmistresses and sub postmistresses, but we can see that there are lots of women working for the post office um, in uh, all across the uh, all across the country. So um, something that we can do with that information is ask lots more questions about what women's working lives were like that we couldn't ask before, and this is going to be um, very new, very interesting. Um, so. We start off with the raw data that you provide. Uh, we've got the um, just a little kind of example of uh, uh, what the index has been able to tell us, and we, we get that data. We start off with this raw data in a spreadsheet, um, and then we can match the places uh, that are in the um, in the index with a, uh, the place names in historic gazetteer. So we've got a list of places uh, in the historic gazetteer. Um, how he did this work, and um, uh, that gives us the latitude and the longitude. Um, and uh, with that information, we can um, plot these individuals. So with the latitude and longitude, we put it into a geographic information system. So we just put it into mapping software um, and we end up with these points. Uh, and then there are lots of other um, things that we can do with that. So we can add, for instance, the historic boundaries of, uh, of counties, um, but it doesn't have to be. We could do it with poor law unions. We could do it with uh, regions. We could do it with countries. We could do it with um, uh, registration districts and sub-registration districts. We, you know, all of these sorts of different geographies are all available. But just as an example, here are the counties, the stock counties as they were at the time, uh, and um, you just lay one on top of the other, and then you can ask the software to tell you how many points are in each of these polygons. You know, how many individuals are in this county or that county? What's the um, uh, what's the population of that country uh, of that county overall? What proportion of the population? Um, would you expect to see retiring with particular um, conditions and so on? You can compare um, all of those different things. So the software will, um, will let us answer all of those questions. So that's what um, some of the work that I've been doing on this is, uh, is all about. And then uh, the exciting bit for me is when we can overlay some of that information on the historic maps. Uh, so um, here's an example um, using uh, um, we've got an old map, we've got a couple of uh, people who retired relatively close to each other, but a, a few years apart, a couple of decades out. Um, so Thomas Gardner, a sub postmaster who retired um, from St. Minion's uh, post office in 1882. We've got James Walston, uh, who retired as a messenger in 1865. So there's two examples of uh, two points chosen relatively randomly um, because they were uh, close together and would fit on one map. So St. Minion's and, and Bannockburn. Uh, just south of Stirling, as it was, um, we can use this, um, use these maps, these old maps, to tell us something interesting about uh, the local area. We can see what kind of conditions these people were in. So at the time, they were working in relatively rural areas. These quite small, um, small village, uh, small, small-ish settlement. Not tiny. There are there are smaller villages. They're not hamlets. They're, there's there's traffic going through, and they're relatively near a big town. They're relatively near Stirling. Um, but we can go and look at what St. Minions was like in a bit more detail. We've got the, um, the, the uh, Ordnance Survey map from the 1860s. I think it's the 1860s, possibly early 1870s. Um, this is the uh, county series. Um, and I, so I think this is the six inch to the mile. Um, I don't think it's 25 inch. Um, that's one of the issues with these old maps. You can't, you get them from these various data sources. You don't always know exactly what the original published scale was, but you can, What's called geo-reference them, so you can you can make them fit into the real world um, with a bit of tweaking. Anyway, in the 1860s, we can see where the post office was. PO, as, as you probably know, um, indicates the post office of St. Ninians. Um, but then, if we look at the 1890s, the 25-inch uh, survey, you can see the post office is actually marked a few uh, doors down. Um, so whether um, there was an error or whether the post office actually moved. Why did it move? Was it because the post office moved when an indiv you know, different individuals were the, the postmaster or the postmistress of the, of the place and it was just their home? And so did the post office move when you had different personnel because they were living in different places to before? Or um, did it have to move because you know, somebody wanted to move premises and that was, that was what happened. So that's a, um, something that will be uh, interesting to, uh, to, to find out about. Um, not that it's absolutely vital to the, uh, 
to understanding the um, the wider context. But these are the sorts of questions that immediately arise when I start looking at old maps. You know, why did the post office move in, in those years? Um, so maybe it's just me that I get a little bit caught up in this kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, you want to get on Google uh, Street View and start looking at all of these places and then you can find out why there's uh, just a belfry and a church in ruins in St. Minions. And it turns out that uh, uh, during the Jacobite rebellion, um, the, uh, the church was used as a munitions store and was blown up. It's totally uh, not relevant to the post office, but um, these are the sorts of things you start looking at when you start looking at these old maps. Okay, um, so something else you can do is see what the area is like now. If you use the National Library of Scotland, I hope this is working for you. I can, I can see this, uh, see some nods. Um, that's great. Um, so you can look at what St Ninians and uh, Bannockburn uh, towns look like now. And of course, they're suburbs of Stirling. They're not their own, um, their own areas anymore, but you can see that they um, can see the development over time. And if you start comparing lots of different uh, maps and in intervening period, you can see gradually how these towns are uh, um, getting uh, more populated. And you can think about what sorts of social changes are happening in these towns over the period. And, what sorts of differences would the um, would the post office uh, be seeing? You know, the the the, the post office in St Ninians and the post office in Bannockburn would be seeing enormous increases in the volume of letters that were coming through, uh, and this reflects something about wider social change as well. Something else that's quite fun is that you can see lots of the um, features remain the same using the modern satellite imagery. Lots of um, uh, um, field boundaries are often in the same places. Um, so if you look on the top right, you'll see some of the, um, some of the field boundaries uh, stay the same. Um, yeah, so I could spend far too long on this and I, I'm aware that time is moving on, so I'm going to move on. Um, you can do the same uh, with Ireland. So the National Library of Scotland's website uh, has got loads of maps for um, England, Wales and Scotland. Um, but uh, if you want um, to do something similar for Ireland, then you use the, um, the uh, uh, the OSI um, website. There, I'll share links later on. Um, you can do something similar. Um, here we've got, uh, um, no, I thought I'd look at what's the most westerly of our um, retirees in this index. So I, I chose Clifton in, in Galway, that's the, the most westerly um, that's in this data set. Uh, and uh, that was Catherine Thomas, who was a sub postmistress and um, retired in 1869. From what I could find out with, you know, just a little bit of research, not nothing in, in much depth. Um, I know that she was operating the post office uh, from at least 1837. Uh, so um, she had a good 30 years um, working in, in this town and died uh, in 1876, age 76. So she was about 37 when she started, at least um, possibly younger when she um, started uh, working in the post office. Um, and uh, she was uh, operating the post office from what is now the sea mist uh, bed and breakfast. Um, you can see it's on uh, on this um, map where I've circled it next to the what's labeled National Bank. Um, the uh, that building is still the Bank of Ireland, uh, and you can see that it's this um, beautiful looking building actually with the um, with the the, the angled front uh, that's indicated to the left of the National Bank. Uh, just to the right of it, on the uh, corner of Market Street, on, on the map, there's another post office labelled, it's labelled post office, um, but that uh, that wasn't the post office until the 1890s. This, um, this map is the earliest map that I could find, and it's from the 1890s. Um, there are earlier maps, but they don't show the, um, uh, the buildings in as much detail, so I thought this was quite a good one. But Clifton in Galway was a, was a new town in the 1830s. It was only founded in, in 1810s or, or early 20s um, by a chap called John Darcy, who was the local landowner and thought a town would be a good thing to have about here. And um, it, it, it grew over the course of the 19th century. But um, when Catherine Thomas started out in Clifton, it was probably brand new. Um, the, uh, it's, so it's quite fun to have a look around there. Anyway, this uh, image um, on the top uh, right is, um, it, it, sorry, in the centre top of uh, the Sea Mist House is uh, from um, Google Maps. So um, uh, Google Street View, lots of fun to be had uh, traveling around comparing what places were like in uh, the 19th century according to the OS maps and comparing them with what they look like now uh, and trying to identify whether buildings have been replaced or uh, just uh, uh, refaced. 
Okay, um, I thought I would just say something a little about the Ordnance Survey. Um, I'm not an expert on Ordnance Survey at all. So um, uh, I, I, I like using old maps and I like working with spatial data, but working with spatial data is, is the thing that I do more than sort of understanding the history of Ordnance Survey. So I suspect there are probably people um, that I'm talking to right now who know an awful lot more about Ordnance Survey uh, than I do. So apologies if, if that's you. Um, but uh, we usually think of Ordnance Survey as being founded in, in 1791, but it has a had a longer history. Its history was um, uh, started to be a, a thing, you know, thinking about let's map the whole of the country um, after the Jacobite uh, rebellion in 1745 um, and uh, the creation of what was called the Duke of Cumberland's map. He was the, the sponsor, he was the, the minister, uh, but um, it largely fell down to a chap called Watson and uh, someone who worked for him called William Roy. And Roy's name is associated with the, um, the maps of Scotland from, from that period uh, and indeed England. And uh, the other thing that um, in, in the 18th century that also kind of fed into this was the London-Paris triangulation, which was completed by 1790. They wanted to work out exactly how far away London and Paris were. And so there was a, a great surveying exercise that was done to do that. And that was followed by um, surveying of the British Isles. And so these maps grew and grew. There were lots of um, reasons for mapping. Some of it was to um, kind of put down potential rebellions in Scotland. Uh, but, uh, Part of it was um, it was felt to be an important thing to do, especially after the Napoleonic period. Um, so there were lots of military reasons, and of course the name is reflected uh, in it reflects that Ordnance Survey, of course, um, but also civil functions as well. And one of the big drivers for mapping the country was uh, the movement for sanitation, trying to um, work out what is in each town, what should each town in, have in it. And, um, and where are all of these things. So it shows things like water sources so that soldiers passing through a village might be able to um, locate the pump easily, um, but also um, it's got a, a wider thing about um, uh, kind of understanding and, and gathering data about society and the country as a whole as a kind of movement uh, towards modernity in a sense. Um, Ordnance Survey um, has digitized uh, 230,000 odd sheets of its, its old maps and these are kind of static maps that you can't really interact with they're kind of base maps um, but they also have lots of um, online interactive uh, products that you can use as well as as pay, paper maps nowadays um, so just a very quick look at Roy's military survey of Scotland um, this is what Glasgow looked like according to um, so the Roy map the Duke of Cumberland's map um, in uh, in about 1750 uh, you might uh, if you're familiar with Glasgow you'll recognize Anderson over here you've got uh, Gorbals uh, south of the river, uh, Govan uh, over here. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving, but you know this is this is this is Glasgow as it was, um, and it's showing um, that lots of these areas that are now very built up, um, as you can see here. Uh, you know, obviously Glasgow is another very good example of urbanisation over the period, um, but Glasgow is uh, you know. A town. I mean, it was a city, but it, it, you know, it was it was a, a decent-sized settlement. Um, but lots of the places that we now think of as just being areas of of, of Glasgow, even central areas of Glasgow, let alone um, Greater Glasgow, are um, villages or farms. And the interesting thing for me is how many of the farm names uh, still exist as um, uh, 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 as the place names or street names um, in the modern era. So, for instance, over here, kind of center, top left-ish, we've got what's spelt as Partak, so Partick, and uh, Byers, um, Byers Road, of course, uh, the sort of area that is running uh, down here. We've got the River Kelvin, of course, this is all part of the um, university district over here, uh, Hindland, and so on. So um, these are all small villages or small settlements or just even farms uh, that are um, present uh, today, so you can follow the, um, the development of places by looking through um, these different uh, ordnance survey products. Um, I thought it might also be just think uh, just just to finish off, um, think about this um, uh, idea about what a map actually is, and just to kind of throw a spanner in the works a little bit, I suppose. Um, we think of maps as being kind of authoritative sent, uh, sources of, of the truth about something in, in many cases. Um, as uh, Harley suggests in his classic work, Deconstructing the Map, 
Um, we often tend to work from the premise that mappers engage in an unquestionably scientific or objective form of knowledge creation. Of course, cartographers believe they have to say this to remain credible, but historians do not have that uh, obligation, which um, is a, a source of comfort to me. So the steps in making a map, selection, emission, simplification, classification, the creation of hierarchies and symbolization, are all inherently rhetorical. So what he's saying is that just as somebody writes uh, a, a piece of text with rhetorical devices in mind, you know, the, you, the selection of words, putting them in particular orders, trying to make a point, maps do exactly the same thing. So it could be as obvious as Roy's map trying to kind of impose uh, London government on what then was called North Britain uh, in, in that kind of direct, really obvious kind of power relation. Um, but it can be a, a more subtle thing. Just the fact of having the Ordnance Survey at all, um, look at what's being shown on the map, tells us what um, successive governments or government agencies or society in general think are important things to put on a map. And it's a certain set of things, and it doesn't tell you an awful lot about very many other things. And different maps, of course, will have different selections of things, and we have to think about what, what does it mean that those things, those features have been selected for showing uh, us and the way that they've been symbolized as well. Um, as uh, Alfred Korzybski said, the map is not the territory. Uh, so with that, um, just a, a, a list of some of the sources where you can get um, some uh, free mapping from. I haven't included the sorts of um, data that you would have to download and use specialist software for. Um, all this will be distributed, so um, you're welcome to take screenshots or um, jot it down, but um, uh, we'll, uh, I'll send this around so you can uh, click on the links instead of having to uh, type them out manually, if that would be helpful. So I hope that was interesting um, and useful tell, tell, telling you a little bit about um, what we've been doing with the data that you've been gathering and how we map it and why place is important to us and the Addressing Health Project.